Thanks ever so much for the invite. Uh, because it's a Friday night, uh, because I need to see how fast I'm going to do this, I'm going to try and get through this in, in 45 minutes, which will be a record. Okay, that's the good news. Uh, then there'll be some questions, but honestly, if you want to go during the questions, or even if you get annoyed over what I'm going to say, just just you can go earlier. I won't be won't be won't be too upset. Um, <laughs> it's the reason. <laughs> The reason I'm saying this is that this is a talk I, I started doing around the country. Uh, I've done it in Northampton, I've done it in Stoke, I've done it in Weymouth. Um, I'm going to interesting parts of Britain. And every week I go to the talk somewhere else, and every week it gets harder to tell jokes. Uh, and it gets harder to tell jokes because the situation appears to be getting more serious. And what happens to me is that somebody comes up at the end and says, how can you think it's funny, it's completely wrecking my life? So I just want to start off with, I do know it's very serious, but if I'm very serious for 45 minutes, you're going to be very bored. So let's, let's try and be a bit upbeat about what's going on. Um, Sally is an Emeritus Professor of Education here. Her speciality is special education and curriculums, uh, looking at what was taught in textbooks including the textbooks written by people in this department 100 years ago, 90 years ago, 80 years ago, which if you're ever very bored and want something else to read apart from all the stuff we tell you to read, honestly, if you go back to what Herbertson wrote and so on, it is fascinating. And then you've got to remember, and that was taught as the truth to people in the 1930s and 40s. And you can look at what people were taught in the 1950s and 60s about Britain about the empire, about what we're made of, about what other people are not made of, about where we should be. And when you begin to look at some of that history of how we have taught the geography of the world differently, it's easier, I think, to begin to understand the age distribution of the boat. I'm going to show you lots of things about the boat. You will have been taught different geographies. It will depend on what kind of school you went to. Uh, we don't all teach the same thing, even though we have a national curriculum and we only have about three A-level boards, your school teachers will influence the kind of geography you're taught. I went to Cheney School in Oxford. There was a poster of Lenin on the wall in the sixth form block. This probably explains part of what I do. You know, I, I was a child. It was a particular school with teachers with a particular ethos, which probably affected me. If I'd gone to a different kind of school, I would have been taught a different kind of history by teachers who believe different things. And that's just people of the same age. Here's a summary of, of the claims we're going to make about the things that matter. And this is peculiar to Sally and I. There are lots of different stories you can tell about Brexit. Firstly, we think you need to know that spreading the fear about immigration has been something that's gone on at least for the whole of my lifetime. Uh, particularly in the 70s, 90s, and in the noughties. The immigrants are coming, the immigrants are terrible, need to get rid of the immigrants, need to take back control, need people to go back where they come from. Um, hostility to the EU has been whipped up repeatedly. But the key thing here is whipped up. Whipped up slightly in 1997 by James Goldsmith and his referendum party. Spent a fortune, and he only got it to 2% of the electorate. Then it disappears again. Then it's whipped up by UKIP in the year before each European election. An increasing number of people in Britain uh, say that they really don't like Europe. But immediately after the European election, bang, they've forgotten they don't like Europe. Somebody's been playing a game. We didn't realise somebody was playing a game until we looked at it recently. The geography of the Brexit vote has been unbelievably distorted by the British press and by academics. The geography is very, very simple. It's how many people in each area voted leave, how many voted remain, how many didn't vote. But you've been told a story that it's Middlesbrough and Stoke and Great Yarmouth and the North that voted leave and the working class and the South wanted to remain. And that isn't the truth. And the remarkable thing is it isn't rocket science, it's geography to show it isn't uh, the truth. So the question is why? <coughs> why don't we actually look at the vote and say what happened? I think, but I would, so I'm the wrong person to say this, and Sally, you know, why is the first country to leave the European community after Greenland 
the UK? And could it be a coincidence that the UK is also the most economically unequal country in Europe? Might it be the rising inequality over the last 30 or 40 years? This has been a real reason why people's lives have got relatively harder, not the immigrants. And could that explain why people, the majority of people in Britain voted for anything but this, you have got anything but this? Who can tell me the one country that left the European community before the UK? Anybody know? Denmark. Not Denmark, but you're close. It's a clue. Anyone want to guess? Norway. Not Norway. They've got a lot of fish. Finland. <coughs> not Finland, not Sweden. Faroes. Faroes is nearish kind of idea. Greenland. Greenland. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> so, I'm glad that I feel useful. I feel useful. Uh, what one country has left before Greenland? Uh, they have 56,000 people, so they spent three years negotiating because they realised it mattered, not two. And I'm going to be blunt about it. Uh, part of the reason they spent three years negotiating, they got quite a good deal. It's because they have fish. They have fish stocks. Uh, and in fact, because of Denmark, they actually kept European Union citizenship because they're also Danish citizens, so they didn't lose out much. Uh, but they're, they're, they left. It's turning out we're learning a huge amount about ourselves. Uh, the Europeans are doing a wonderful job, the Europeans on the mainland, of not pointing out the obvious to us. We haven't got fish. The fish stocks are really low. We're doing a negotiation at the moment, which is all about what are we worth and what do they want, and it's embarrassing. And the Europeans on the mainland are doing a wonderful job of not being the first. The game in the mainland of Europe is don't be the first person to say, look, you've got nothing to offer, and we don't like your bankers. Right, that's, that's, where, that's where we are. Um, we have never understood our empire because we told ourselves a lie about it, and this really matters now. We think we should be richer than we are because we were richer in the past, and something's gone wrong, and we need Empire 3.0. We tell ourselves that we were a great civilising force that went around the world and made things better, and put in railways and brought Christianity and so on. And until we get the story right, we're stuck. Um, the reason why we were the richest country on earth 100 years ago is that we were the centre of an empire. All centres of empire get tributes from the colonies that they control. I don't know what you were taught in your history. I was taught all about spinning jennies in Manchester. Nobody told me where the cotton came from, who picked the cotton, or who was forced to buy the material that we wove from the cotton. 5248, in hindsight, is perfect. It's not quite um, 5446, which is the Toots and the Maytow song that one of the audience might know. Um, but 5248 is perfect, in hindsight. And it's perfect because almost any other result would have been disastrous. If we'd had it the other way around, 52% remain, 48% leave. You know what would have happened. We'd be having a second referendum. Right? The Brexiteers are, are determined. The story is robbed by the BBC, unfair vote, ever so narrow, um, you know, campaigning, 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 second referendum. Right? It will be going on. If it had been a 60, 65% leave vote, we'd be heading straight for Singapore of the West, Empire 2.0, you know, rather than it being this current kind of state of, oh, something's gone badly wrong. I, I challenge you later to tell me a better result than 52.48. I, I think 52.48, in hindsight, given where we are, is very good. Immigration mattering as a problem. What you're seeing here is the net immigration on the line in the 1970s. It was actually negative. For half the last 150 years, we've lost more people than have come in. People have had to leave. We've had an empire to stock and man, but also we had recessions where we lost people. So net immigration was negative, but trend is upwards. National Front, my child in Oxford was dominated by the National Front. They sprayed swastikas on the subway walls near my house. They sprayed swastikas on the walls of my house because I'm from a mixed race family. They beat up my brothers at school and they told them to go back where they came from. 
that's 1970s racism. This is partly why I don't like Brexiteers, because telling people to go back where they come from is not nice, particularly to children. Net immigration slowly, slowly rising. But suddenly, the dislike of immigration, which is what you're seeing here, is whipped up <coughs> in time. Our problems are created by, and in this case, the AA countries being allowed in a bit early. Which is very clever, because we got the first movers. We got the quickest Polish plumbers. Right. Um, here you go again. This is immigration. In elections, it's the most salient issue, and it was for ages, election after election. When you said to people, what matters most? They said immigration. It's the most, most salient issue until the biggest financial crash in the world since 1929. And then the economy managed to beat it into second place as the thing that matters the most. Until we got a bit calmer <coughs> around 2014 and those immigrants were the biggest problem again that we had. Terrible. Absolutely coming in and wrecking everything. Um, as you see immigration, this is the other brilliant thing about 5248. What does it take to teach the British that immigrants are not a problem? Sadly, it's 5248. Already 100,000 have not come from the mainland. People are leaving. We're going to find out. We've called a bluff. Immigration is no longer a problem. Europe, obviously, is a big issue. So Europe now is, is the top issue as far as most is as concerned. And look, the enemy is coming in. Um, occasionally, we managed to get inequality. Uh, to feature, but not much more than to feature. If we were the United States of America, you'd all recognise this graph. We don't draw it here. It's the graph of uh, where people living in the country at each census state from 1841 were born. I made the graph simpler, or my friend Kirsten, to be honest, who's great with graphics, has made it simpler because the original has 40 countries. You're looking at Ireland originally, large numbers of people coming in from Ireland, there's a famine. We have, uh, I won't try in the remaining 35 minutes I've got to tell you a different version of British history from the one you're taught. But then, so we were not particularly nice to the Irish, who were one of our colonies. Particular events, terrible influx of Jewish people. Um, we tried to stop it. British Union of Fascists was formed because you never know what's happened if you let Jewish people into your country. This, it goes on and on again. Here's the Windrush generation coming in. Terrible what's going to happen. Send them back. Um, every group who comes in, of course, within a generation, they're part of what you are. And here's the Eastern European one. And you may look at that and you may say, oh, look, look, it's accelerating. It's going up even faster. It's a real problem. We're talking seven, eight million people, you know. This weird middle class woolly professor standing in front of you doesn't have an idea what real people feel like when their homes and their areas are invaded. So have another look at the same data another way. And it's small. I'm going to show you a bit more how small it is. It's also simply people moving further. People are moving further than they used to move because cheap air flights, you can Skype home, more education, more aspiration. Uh, the largest immigrant group in the United Kingdom are the English living in Wales. Um, by far the largest, if you count, the people born in one country living in another. And they, are, they can be a problem. They include my parents. Um, they, can, they put the house prices up. They don't speak the language, you know. Um, which the local schools teach in, in Midwest Wales. And then they come with their strange, arrogant attitudes and buy the Western Daily Mail and ask the local police what they're doing about crime. And when the local police tell them the only crime around here is speeding and being drunk and it's you, <laughs> the English who retire in Wales don't like it. Anyway, in England, for children, the largest concentrated immigrant group are located around Hyde Park, which has the highest proportion. And they're children born in the United States of America. And they're the children of bankers. Um, if you're worried about immigrants and the effect of immigrants. But I'll go through these quick. This is the kind of thing I did for years. This is a map drawn with Beck and Thomas. These are 16 to 24 year olds. Each hexagon is a parliamentary constituency. Uh, they're cut in half and they're coloured like blue 
if the most common ethnicity of somebody of the age of most of you in this room is white, uh, and the second white British, and the second most common ethnicity is another kind of white. So it's a white country. It's very, very boringly white in most of it. It's like, look, you have to go, here's Oxford. Like those two constituencies, Oxford East and West. It's white and more white. Right, really. There are some places I was in Stoke, so I highlighted Stoke, and this is a bit of London, where you most likely find people who are white, and then black African is the second most common for a 16 and 24 year old. But honestly, this is, this is for youngsters. It's like you. You know, I'm looking largely to see a white faces we have the old person who's a bit, a little bit not white. Right, and that, that's the country. Um, immigration, Europe, 2014. This is Eurostat data. The areas are shaded blue. Uh, if more than a fifth of the population are born in another country. I'm going to rattle through this. I'm hoping. What I normally do, I'll, oh no, I'll depress myself, so I'll do it anyway. What I normally do, if I'm in like Great Yarmouth in this talk, I ask people who's seen a map like this before. So I'm going to say, who's seen a map like this before? You put your hand up. Oh, good. Some of you may be very happy. Normally, one person puts their hand up, and I have to spend half an hour explaining it. It's a population map. We stretch it by population. That's Madrid. This is Spain. This is Paris. You're very, very quick. You've got their special brains. So I'm allowed to go quick through this. Here's London. Uh, dark blue areas over a fifth of the population of all in another country. In a sense, that's where the immigrants are. Very few immigrants in Eastern Europe. There are people from Russia and further east, but not many. Less than 5%. Lots of immigrants in parts of Paris, lots in Switzerland, lots in capital cities of towns. Loads of immigrants along the coast in Spain. They're old, they tend to turn red. And they, you're going to get to meet them. <laughs> because if they get ill after March 29th, they've got to fly back. It's going to be wonderful. Um, and here, Ireland, high number of people. You know, there's, kind of, there is, there's not a border in Ireland. I mean, there isn't a border in Ireland. And lots of people have crossed over that non border, which you cannot do anything about because of a treaty we signed. And those people were born on different sides of that non border. We are being taught a lesson about the fact there is not a border at the moment. Very slowly, there is not a border in Ireland. UK, yellow, low immigration, apart from London. Okay, just very simple. 2014, after the A8, like Eastern Europe, no immigration in most of the UK. You do not come to somewhere and stay there unless there is an opportunity. Different to what you're taught. Here's the leave and remain proportions over time. Uh, we start off 2011-2012 after the financial crisis with very high leave majorities. Um, everything's wrong, must be due to the immigrants, not to the fact we've banked everything on banking and had a huge, huge crash. Uh, we then move around quite a lot, and when Lucky Dave sees Remain get up to here, Lucky Dave, because everything's always gone right in Dave's life, <laughs> Lucky Dave goes hard call a referendum. And to make Gideon, to make Gideon tells him, don't do it, Dave, it won't work. Anyway, he calls the referendum. And there you can see there's support for leave slowly dropping the ones up down here. And um, the support for leaving. MP gets stabbed. You think nothing's going to happen. Turns out most people don't worry too much about MPs. Um, the stoking up. This particular diagram is called a phase, phase space. And what it's showing you, the vertical axis is the support for, U for UKIP and the rest of the far right. Um, over time from 1999 onwards. Very little support, so that's James Goldsmith getting 2%. Managed to get it up to about 2% for 2004, goes down again, up to about 5% for 2009. These are European election dates. Goes down again. Huge rise for 2014, hails it up for 2016 in the referendum. Bang, this particular measure is down here. You don't need people to say they're going to vote UKIP anymore now. It's done its job. Not the second <coughs> view of the British people. British people are not inherently attracted to fascism. You have to shove newspapers full of headlines about people preaching hate for mosques 
for that time to get the vote we want. This is absolutely remarkable. We've had European elections since 1979. In 1979, nobody voted for far-right candidates. They just didn't stand. And that's stunning, because the National Front came into my school, right? They were all around. I know which was their pub in Oxford. They wanted to get the black men out of the car factory. But 1979, no far-right. 1984, no far-right. 1989, it was one in a thousand people voted for National Front. 1994, 1.1% vote far-right. 1999, 7.5%. 2004 gets up to 20.4. 2009, I've added half the Tory vote to get to that. The reason I've added half the Tory vote is 2009, the Conservative Party in this country left the large European Conservative bloc of MEPs. We actually left me mainstream Europe as far as the political alliance. The Conservative Party had polled all the way through today. And then, by the time of the 2014 European <coughs> elections, our Conservative Party was allied with far-right parties in Europe, the Free Finns, Alternative for Deutschland, and so on. That lot, the nasty folk, some of the nasty folk in Hungary. The other nasty folk in Hungary are actually still with the mainstream European Conservatives. But the point I want to get to you is that, and we never saw this at the time, we didn't see why it mattered, you know, only a third of people vote in these elections, we didn't care. In the 2014 European elections, 52% of people voted for a far-right party by European standards in the UK. We go on about the far-right Le Pen in France, or what's going on in Austria, or what's going on in Sweden. It was us. But of course, if you're there, if you're in the goldfish bowl, you don't see yourself as far-right. You're just normal. It's reasonable. Surely, Danny, you can understand the Conservative view. You know. It was there, 52%. I didn't see it. So then you look back, and then you look back and you see what happened and what we did. Here's the map of the referendum. It's a wonderful map because it isn't like any other map in the UK. I've drawn thousands and thousands of maps of the UK. They all begin to look exactly the same. Maps of health, maps of education, maps of voting, right? The same areas where people don't get very... You give loads of aids to people in areas where the house prices cost a lot. You tell them, well done, you've done very well at school. That kind of, and they don't die. Um, I, I've drawn so many maps, you wouldn't believe how bored I am of drawing maps in the UK. No map looks like this. This really is quite remarkable. Um, this is which is majority leave, which is majority remain. Most of Britain is leave. Not much leave, just enough leave. 52, 53, 54, 55, 56. This is the proportion, so remain strongest in Oxford, London, much more important, Cambridge, Bristol, Manchester, Liverpool. Leave, you can find a few parts of the East Coast with high proportions, but generally, generally it's left. The best predictor uh, is migration. The fewer immigrants, the more likely are to vote leave. It's not ironic, people come to areas it's worth coming to, where there are opportunities. So if people aren't coming to your area, there's something going wrong. Um, I'll leave that for the moment, you need to imprint, imprint that in your head. <coughs> By age, we know exactly how many people voted leave and remain. And by area, we know turnout. Because Lord Ashcroft did this incredible survey, huge exit poll. Why did he do a huge exit poll? Because he assumed that he was going to leave. He looked, he's a lever. He funded an enormous exit poll, so he would have the evidence about why we needed another vote because of who had been robbed. Bless him though, Lord Ashcroft had the decency to release his exit poll, so we all get the data. And that's partly why, why we know who's going on. Abstentions are harder, but anyway, who who could who could who had the right to vote? Any of you in 2016? So you've got to be 18. You've got to be a British citizen or Commonwealth. Right. To all the others, you can blame you lot. Uh, who did vote in 2016? <coughs> Nobody ever admits they're not voting. I won't ask you how you voted. For those of you who were 16, 18, 24, you're weird because your age group just didn't vote. Right? Um, which is okay because your age group have not voted since 1991. 
since we introduced a poll tax as a special incentive not to vote. Um, but then those who did vote voted in May. So it's almost used because all these people didn't vote. Uh, 25 to 34 year olds, it's getting better over turning out. Uh, and you can see that the, the remain <coughs> there, a bit more. What used to be my age group, <laughs> or, <laughs> anyway, there, there's, there's your, there's your um, This graph, I think, along with the story of the curriculum books, really matters. This is the value of the dollar for the pound over time. When my granddad was studying just down Mansfield Road at this weird place called the School of Geography, when my granddad was there, you could get five dollars to the pound. <coughs> you thought you were on top of the world. When my mum was a child, it was four. When I was a child, it was three. When my oldest child was born, it was two. It's heading towards one. When I went to France on a school trip with those lefty teachers who damaged my brains, given this weird ideology, they actually spent the whole time drinking in France, the teachers. <laughs> when, I, when I went to France, uh, you could get 10 francs to the pound, which is why the teachers from Cheney spent the whole time drinking. Because it cost them nothing. If you've flown by France this summer, it was one pound eleven p for a euro at Gatwick. Right? Somebody of my age, we, what's happened to this country? You've gone from a point where you were lording it over the rest of the world, and you were proud to be British, and you won the World Cup. Through <laughs> to this kind of miserable point where if you are old, you worry about your children and your grandchildren because your grandchildren can't start a family and you quite like to see a great grandchild just before you die. But there's no way they can get a house or a mortgage. And the job they're getting isn't paying enough. And something's gone really wrong. The old didn't vote to leave selfishly for themselves. Right? The old are clever enough to know they don't have that long. They voted for, for me because they bought something that's gone wrong. And you can see part of the thing that's gone wrong there. By geographical area. This is just England. These little slices are the most deprived tenth of constituencies. Okay, almost all represented by Labour voters. And these are the ten constituencies with the least deprivation, the poshest ones. Um, it goes slightly higher because you can't divide it by ten. But anyway, you've cut the country into ten. Uh, Geographies, each being a collection of parliamentary constituencies. Uh, leave central, sorry, remain central, strong remain, is the poshest. Right. Poshest areas, I, I don't think any of our Oxford ones are, mainly London, West London, which part. Right. Places where you go skiing twice at Christmas. You do Tuscany in the summer. The question is, where do you go in Easter? Is it Paris again? You're going to retire, like Cameron and Clegg's dad, you die in France. Of course you do, why would you die in this place for that? That's your life, your life is very, very European, you're very rich, or you love the fact that all these Europeans around you, um, they're partly working in all the cafes and everything else that keeps your dark lights nice and comfortable. That's Remain, massively, massively strong Remain, weak Remain and so on. But what matters here is that the strongest lead is in deciles four, five, and six. Middle England. Right? Middle England voted leave more than the poor it's parts of England. <coughs> it's, clues, it's clues like that that we're beginning to get. I'll leave that one up and not say much about it, but it's a turnout that matters. It's a bit like studying a riot is studying this vote. Uh, Martin Luther King said about, about riot, you you have to wait for two or three years before you can say things about a riot that you're allowed to say about what it told you. Abstention rates were low in the South. People turned out to vote. The numbers of people were high. That's why the South is really important. Wales, you know, we often talk about Wales and, you know, why on earth did the Welsh vote to leave when they get all these subsidies and so on? Wales was bang on the averages. Wales was average UK. It's amazing that the, the, the unfairness of the reporting of the vote, something as simple as that. And it's because the vote took us by surprise. Normally, the people who report on the vote report on general elections. And reporting on general elections is really easy. With, you know, I like John Curtis and he's a friend, but honestly, 
It's easy. This is how you do it. You remember how they reported on the last election, right? And then you assume things are going to change a little bit. And you talk about all, oh, you know, those declining industrial areas there, Labour Corp, and, you know, and it's all easy because you just do exactly what you did five years ago with a little bit of a tweak, and you sound ever so knowledgeable. And you put it all into a computer model and you press a button and you use the computer model that's rather like the one you used last time. And you tell a story like your friends tell and you look like you report. And the problem for people who do that is when this thing came along, we hadn't had one before. And they tried to interpret it like a general election. And many of the political scientists who've written on it, and probably me, you know, I've done this myself, they're actually telling you far more about themselves. And what they're telling you is they don't know about the north of England. Uh, they don't know that working class people tend not to vote. So the key thing is that the turnout's low, so it doesn't matter. Uh, and they're really rather embarrassed that their mum and dad in Hampshire voted leave, because they live in West London and were Remainers. Um, there are more leave voters in Essex than in these 22 areas down here, which include, among them, Knowlesley, Lancaster, Lincoln, Richmond, so I can go on. Uh, they have an electorate bigger than Essex, but there's, there's more people. Blind Eye Gwent, fourth area of Wales, locally. Now you might know that, you might think, but Essex was really, really important. There's more people who voted Leave in Kent than the combined electorate who voted Leave in Derby, Blackpool, Rotherham, Sheffield. Do you remember when they said, oh, Sheffield, that's amazing, it's going to go? No, it wasn't. Kent was amazing. Great Yarm of Harley Paul Merthyr. More people voted Leave in Hampshire. Hampshire's my favourite. Right? You tell me the rundown part of Hampshire. You know, it's very boring to live in Fleet and have to commute to London, but you know, so you're not suffering really. More people, it's got a university town, Southampton. More people voted Leave in Hampshire, despite Hampshire having a smaller electorate than the combined, this is what I call anti Hampshire. Bolts over Doncaster, Hull, Chesterfield, Salford, Stoke on Trent, and Sunderland. You put them all together, you face opposite Hampshire, and Hampshire, more people vote Leave. Have you ever heard anybody say it was Hampshire that did it? Right. And this isn't the majority of Leave voters live in the south of England, the majority of Leave voters for social class A, B and C1. So what's going on? And I've got 15 minutes left. Things have gone wrong for Middle Britain. Things have gone wrong for the middle class. Things have gone wrong for people who are actually social class A, but not in the 1 or 2%. I am in the 3%. I'm telling you nothing because that's a complete professorial salary range. Right, and it's no giveaway. All your professors are in the 3%. Because I'm in the 3%, I'm able to get a mortgage on a house in Oxford three times smaller than the one I grew up in. Just. And some other poor sod doesn't get to live there. And the house I'm in was built by somebody who was a gardener at the college. Right? And I'm just about okay. But my children won't let to get houses. And I'm in the 3%. This is what's gone wrong. Um, now, a lot of people don't realise that things aren't okay for them. They think that the government will look after their house price and that somehow, you know, their house worth £400,000 will be shared out amongst grandchildren, of which they've had four, who will use the £400,000 to somehow buy a house in the future. You know, they're slowly beginning to cotton on. This isn't going to work. Most unequal country in Europe. If you want to understand where we are, lovely spelling mistake there if you've got good eyesight, slightly more unequal to us is Russia, <coughs> slightly less unequal to us is Israel. Right, that is our society. We live in a society that is like Russia and Israel, Israel including the West Bank and us. That's it, we're used to it. So we don't, it's not, we don't look around and go, why is that person sniping through the wire? Or you know, why are those gangsters getting all that money in that part of Moscow? Everything we see, which is the equivalent of that, it's just life. You know, of course, somebody who owns a building firm who's made a few bob building on the back of Coke to buy makes 75 million pounds last year. That's fine, it's an incentive. <coughs> we, don't, we don't see that in the same kind of way that you see gross inequality and corruption in other <coughs> countries. Of course, it's normal to step over bodies late at night when you're coming back from a nightclub. You know, they're probably going to survive through the night as it gets colder and colder. You get used, to, you get used to it. If you want to go above rough over Lithuania that pops in and out, the United States is even worse. Hence, 
use death of AIDS really bad poverty, too many people in prisons from year one. Turkey, it's a fun club here, particularly in Mexico. Uh, there are 40 countries below, but you'll be thankful I'm not going to show you. They're normal, we're not. We are the first to vote leave after Greenland. And I don't think it's unrelated, because the option we gave people, which you either stay with things exactly as they are, or you vote for anything but this. And they voted for that. You may believe that people voted for sovereignty um, against the terrible <laughs> Brussels brewer cats or the capitalist machine in Brussels. Uh, the extent to which Brussels is full of bureaucrats is us. We are the people who put in most of the rules. We like rules. We're British. If you wonder why there are lots of rules from the European Union, there are rules. On the mainland, they call them the British rules. And, you know, why was the European Union pro free market and a bit nasty and all that? Oh, look, it was us again. Who do you think argued for that? For that? I mean, the future for the EU27 is looking really good. We're about to take out 73 or odd MEPs. This is the nastiest bunch of MEPs that there are on the mainland. No joke. The core of all the far-right fascist groups in the Parliament are our MEPs. That's the big numbers. We don't think of ourselves like that, but just look it up. Just look it up, type into Wikipedia, European Parliamentary Group, and look who belongs to each of the groups. With those people that our press, our BBC, describe in other countries as far-right, Look at who's in the same group as them, voting alongside them in the Parliament. I'm amazed that somebody on the mainland doesn't say, we're really happy you're going. You know, it's amazing how polite they are. Um, and what, just one graph showing the effect of inequality, because you're all brilliant at maths, you've worked it out for yourselves. Uh, this shows you that people do quite badly at maths tests in unequal countries. Not at age 16, but if I was to apply to you lot... If we were to sit down now and do the GCSE exam that you did when you were age 16, uh, some of you would have been taught how to get an A star in that, and others of you would have got an A star because you really love maths. So put up your hand if you really love maths. Well, hey, we've got a few. We're in Oxford. It's great. Um, un unequal countries teach the test because it really matters that you get the grades. More equal countries, the ones who are high up there on the international scales, teach, this is really weird, so I've got to explain this idea. More equal countries have an education system and teach in a way that people enjoy what they do so that years later they can still do it. Okay? That's not what we do in Britain. We're all about getting the highest grades you can get so that you can say you're special and then you can enter a university in a competition between all our universities rather than doing the normal thing of going to the university in your town. Um, I've got ten minutes. The British Empire, <coughs> it was big. You draw it this way, it was India. There's lots of it. There's a lovely quote from Gordon Brown in one of his books that says that we managed, I think it's off the kind of 196 larger countries in the world, we, we invaded 190 of them at one point. Um, somebody would have done it. Other countries had empires, just nothing, nothing like ours. The world population went from 1 billion when we started doing this to 6 towards the end of it. It's not because we were raping and pillaging. It's because we were upsetting stable social systems. Um, if you upset a stable social system, you get a population boom. The most dramatic upset was Australia. Managed to keep going fairly civilised for 50,000 years before we turned up. This image, this is the kind of way, this is the last colony. Hong Kong was the last colony. And the image, and I can remember it, was of a, the daughter of the Chancellor of this university crying over the tragedy of, of losing British civilization over Hong Kong and returning Hong Kong to the despotic control of China and their communism and so on. That was a image that, I don't know if you're probably the wrong age to see it, but, you know, he's wiping away her tears. It's lovely as Prince Charles is over, over there, looking completely gormless, not knowing what to do when a woman's crying. Because he went to a school with boys. You know, poor man. <laughs> you know. Anyway, I should, I should pull the one up Prince Charles. What you need to know about that picture is that she wasn't crying because we're leaving Hong Kong. 
We well, need to know she was crying for four hours. Right. Why does a young woman cry for four hours? She was asked recently in a newspaper article why she was crying. And it was because the young surfer boy she was having to leave was lovely and beautiful. She was having to leave her boyfriend because Van had a new job and it couldn't stay. She couldn't care less about the Empire of Hong Kong. It's not that much of a revelation. But, but of course she wasn't crying about the British Empire. It's, you know, of course she wasn't. She says she wasn't. Um, but she had to leave the surfer. Another kind of quick... I hope she got to meet the surfer again. <laughs> anybody ever know, finds out how the story went? Um, <coughs> chair of GDP in manufacturing. You know, there's China. You can see it, but I'm fixed it up. We, we're down here. <coughs> we do this because you can't get down to zero. Um, One percent of our GDP. Well, I'll show you. This is what we actually make. It's not AI. It's not high tech. It's not silicon roundabout. You know, Dyson is a vacuum cleaner and a hand dryer. Um, <laughs> vacuum hasn't yet produced much. We can be proud. Our top is transport, 15%. And of that 15%, one, one massive, 1% one of our entire manufacturing output is two miles that way, uh, 3,000 people working there, 1,200 robots, a mini car coming out every minute and two seconds. Uh, and that's one fifteenth of that top um, profit in terms of transport. Um, yes, we do still make, well, the Germans who kind of put their car factory uh, into county still do a good job. Um, then food, drink and tobacco, tobacco, then metals and metal products. Anybody know what metals and metal products actually means? Arms. Arms, Arms. yes. It's weapons. Yeah. So where are you from? Why do you for this? Because we've got, we're getting a slight bit of sense of, we're not like, I mean, it, we are moving away from empire slowly. Uh, so I, li I lived and worked in Sheffield for 10 years before, before coming here. In Sheffield, we have a brilliant word for it, even better than the metals. We called it cutlery. <laughs> <laughs> and we had the master cutler, who, who was the, the chief arms manufacturer. Spoons, knives, forks. Um, absolutely splendid. Uh, if, if anybody wants an argument about Empire 2.0 later, this is where we import from. This is where we export to. Um, USA matters, but nothing as much as if you add up all the blue areas. This is India. We import 9 billion stuff from India. We export 5.2. We're sending a lot of money to India for the stuff we buy from India. India doesn't want to buy the things we make. Um, because we're not that good at making things. And it's not our fault we're not that good at making things. Because for 200 years we controlled the largest empire the world's ever known. So we didn't have to be very good at making things. We just had to be very good at getting people from Africa across to America on ships, keeping them alive, making sure they picked cotton, getting that cotton and everything else back to us, destroying the Indian textile industry, and making sure that they bought our goods, and at the same time insisting, because free trade is so important, that the Chinese buy the opiates we were growing in India, and flooding the markets of China with opiates so that we could destroy that country. So every child in China is taught that what the British do is sell drugs. <laughs> and we cry about leaving Hong Kong because we spread civilization. It's, it's not our fault. Every empire in the world has had this thing of telling itself its own story and then having to learn the fact that it wasn't necessarily the nicest place on earth. Two or three minutes left, so I must be quick. A group of men particularly matter. Matthew Elliott, kind of, he wrote to Matthew and said, please give me your picture, and he said, would you like this one? <laughs> so, anyway. Matthew Elliott, <laughs> chief executive of the boat leave. Um, you've got to get inside, try and get inside Matthew's head. I'm a geographer, so I won't try and get inside Matthew's head. But taught a particular kind of job through from a particular background in a particular kind of school. Different schools. Young, these young men are not from the public schools, these young men are from cheap private schools. Um, Boris, more expensive. 
slightly higher correlate than immigration. This is my favourite one. The highest correlate with voting leave is obesity, 0.8. <laughs> uh, and it's not because, as a, as, a, as a young man, he found this correlation out shortly after the vote. It's not because people who are overweight are feckless and don't think carefully. I have, let's try out this joke, that about a year ago, I was very thin. But I've been eating a lot just to test out, to check that people with my girth are not <laughs> lazy bastards who don't know what they're doing. Um, anyway, why do you get a good correlation between obesity and leave? Immigration. Uh, uh, it relates to other things, but immigrants you might have noticed, if you've seen some, you may be one yourself, they tend to be young, fit, well-educated and thin. And the more who turn up in there, it's not just they're young, fit, well-educated and thin, it has an effect. So you lot in Oxford who are from England would be a bit larger if it wasn't for more people in Oxford who are not from England, who've arrived with their young, fit bodies. It's called, there's a term in epidemiology for this, it's called the epidemic of obesity. If you live in an area where people are fatter, it's easy to be fat because you don't think you're fat. I can actually be thin in the United States. I really can. <laughs> I really can but <laughs> in Kyoto, I am the fattest man. Anyway, uh, here, deprivation, vote leave. Correlation, 0 0.03. 0 0.03. Uh, some interesting patterns in there, but anyway. 0 0.03. Changing attitudes by age. Pride and embarrassment about feeling English. Things are changing over time. Who's going to be most effective? This was done by Standard & Poor and actually released before the vote. And they were incredibly spot on. The other part of Europe being most effective would be Ireland and there'd be quite a lot of issues about Ireland. They knew that before the vote, Standard & Poor. They're not geniuses. <laughs> They've just got some data together. And then another former colony, Malta. And the key thing here is Malta's very small. So if the Maltese are a bit pissed off about us leaving, they can't do much about it. And then Luxembourg, which because it's a tax haven has some money, but it's also small. And then another colony, former colony Cyprus, and then Switzerland, which doesn't get a choice because it's not in the EU. And then finally Belgium, and the effect is tiny. So the losers from Brexit are not the big European countries. No wonder the negotiations haven't got anywhere. That's showing wage changes since the crash. We may not know it, but we were as bad as Greece. They have a higher life expectancy in Greece. They have better infant mortality in Greece. Uh, but we think of ourselves as different to Greece. Our life expectancy has been falling since 2014, the only part of Europe which has been falling. Our infant mortality has risen for the last two years. Two weeks ago on Thursday, there are six maternity centres in this county. Five of them closed their doors. All home births were cancelled in the county of Oxfordshire. All the midwives were moved in an emergency situation to the John Radcliffe, and everybody who was having a baby was told to come to John Radcliffe. You were told if you lived in Chipping Norton to check Facebook to see when the delivery centre was opening. And what they didn't say that they should have said is whatever you do if you live in Chipping Norton, do not go into labour at 6.30 in the morning. He was trying to drive from Chipping Norton to the John Magnet at 6.30 in the morning when, you know, 40,000 people drive over on Rebel every day. You can't get there. If you want, I can go on about this, as you can tell, but I've run out of time. Um, this little dot here, this is GDP growth. We had GDP going up, but even though finally we had GDP growing up after the recession, we still cut people's wages. Hello. What that means is people in charge of money got richer, but they wanted all the extra money for themselves and a bit more, so they took it off the wages of the average worker. Group. And if you're trying to piss the public off, that's the way to do it. In Greece, GDP goes down, but wages went down together. Um, we are a very, very odd country that reacted to the economic crash in a very strange way. This graph was released by ONS. It's shown as in 1990 going from being the seventh best country in Europe for neonatal mortality to the 19th by 2015. The Royal College produced a report this week saying that we expect the relative gap to increase by 250% by tw 2030. Uh, we will be doing much worse than Romania when it comes to babies dying. 
and that it's the babies of English-born mothers because the immigrants are young and fit and well-educated. It's not the babies of immigrants. And it's not more premature births because you have premature births all over Europe. That line, when I was born, in 1968, we were about first because we had the first baby incubators in a hospital in this city. We were the best in the world. And now if you're choosing where to have a child, you really should think carefully at the moment. I mean, it's just solvable. It isn't rocket science to make delivery safe. But a third of midwives in central London, and I suspect in Oxford, I've got the data box, but central London, a third of midwives are EU, but not UK citizens. This is the data on life expectancy. It's actually mortality rates going down, and then this thing, which hasn't happened. This one, if you, I can do disaster graph after disaster. This, this is a quarter of children now with private rent, rent to private landlords. Um, you don't want to be renting for a private landlord as a child. If you rent from a private landlord in London and you're a family with children, on average you're moved every three years. If you're moved every three years, that could be moving school, losing all your friends, starting again. London have managed to achieve the best educational results in the whole country. And then suddenly, after the 2008 crash, we have a situation in which, you know, we're back to Rackman times again. What could you do? <laughs> my friend person. Well, if you were a very clever geographer, well taught from one of the best departments in the world. Okay, options. I don't know what's going to happen. But it was an advisory referendum. But it only advised one person. That's not the parties. It only advised the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister had to decide when to trigger Article 50. And once the Prime Minister has triggered Article 50, she is the only one who can cancel it. She doesn't have to ask anybody else. If she's having a very bad time of it, supposing you know, things are feeling a bit much at the moment, she'll get a bit of paper. And she's got to write a letter to Brussels. And she's got to write, I revoke Article 50, dated, sign it sneak out the back door of Penn Downing Street, put it in the letterbox, come back again and start writing the speech for the House of Commons. Like, might, it's not impossible. Similarly likely, we might just crash out. Negotiations go all the way to 10 o'clock on March 29th, and we crash out because somebody wants to put a yoghurt pot on the Irish nun border. Um, we don't know. But what we do know, I think, is whatever happens, it's going to be very bad. Even if we revoke Article 50, even if it's a people's vote, whatever happens, lots of the damage will have been done. It's not necessarily damage, it's just an accelerated point of realising that we've got a problem. It's like being an alcoholic and finding out a few years early that you're an alcoholic. You know, it could be good. Um, we've got problems. This thing, strange things happen. The reason for this graph is like the one of you, Kim, I showed you earlier. I've drawn 2,000 graphs of voting in polling of all the polling data we get in Britain. Um, that in April, May and June of last year is the fastest, largest swing in the history of voting in Britain. When, let's take you through it, Corbyn becomes leader, Labour Party is disarray, slapping him in the back, it's all the way down to February 2017, they're on 26%. If you're an advisor to the Prime Minister, you tell the Prime Minister, you have to call an election. Because nobody has ever lost an election from this position. Call an election, increase your majority, show you in control of the country, and then you'll be in a great position for negotiating our exit from the EU. So you call an election, and you do exactly the right thing. <coughs> because you should do that. And then the impossible happens. Now, people who've never voted and don't normally vote suddenly decide that they're going to vote. And they do it in increasing numbers every day until you get up to that date. And the reason for going on about this is it means we do not know what will happen when an election is called. Right? The boundaries of what is possible have just been moved. These are the swings. The Conservatives got a plus five swing at the last election, but Labour got almost a plus ten. You're told a different story of what happened. That's the 45 win for Labour. Uh, this is when I was a kid in the 60s and we got very excited about some of it. Um, this is Tony Blair and his swing in 1997, but it wasn't really a swing for Blair. It was people sick of 18 years of conservative rule and some lies of corruption. Voting for Blair, Blair stands without that, he loses votes. 
Brett Blair stands for a third time, he loses votes. Still wins the election, because that's the money that loses votes. Poor old Brown stands. You know, he doesn't know how to do the smile that Blair can do. And he had the biggest financial crash since 1929. He loses even more votes. <coughs> Lovely little lead me the band. Eats the bacon sandwich. Mm -hmm. We now know why he was made to eat the bacon sandwich. And that's anti-Semitism in British politics. Eats your bacon sandwich, does everything else right, talks about the environment, learns to walk and talk slightly on stage, gets plus 1.4% positive swing. Very, very good. Better than Tony, better than Gordon. Just not enough. You'd have to have another 10 general elections at that rate. You know, and then Ed Miliband would be dead. <laughs> and then, completely incompetent man who just doesn't know what he's doing, stands, get half a million members, largest political movement in Europe, and he gets that. Right? And everything begins to change. And you've got to try and negotiate from a position of being in an alliance with the TUP, uh, which again you couldn't make up. Only a couple of graphs left, the police and questions. Uh, geography, we won't worry about the history. This is just showing what different countries do. We are on track to spending about 36% of our income on public services. In Finland and France and Denmark, where people walk around like zombies and nothing works, they're spending 56, 53% on public services. Um, the difference between the Tory and the, and the Conservative manifestos are between about 36 and 38. So our entire argument is in that bracket. Right? That's where we're at. Um, you're not told about what they do in the rest of Europe. But they're really going to miss us. You know, and our wonderful... <laughs> uh, we're not good at protesting. So who's going along on Saturday, tomorrow? Any of you... Some, we're not good at posting. Don't worry. Um, there's a little march in London. Um, the Germans are almost the worst at protesting. Only 30% of Germans have ever been on a protest. I mean, compared to normal Europeans, that's crap. Except for us, it's 15%. Now, why would you protest? We're good subjects of the sovereign. We only became citizens by accident when Tristan Gowell Jones, the minister, was drunk and signed a bit of paper and actually made us European citizens. First time we've ever been citizens in the history of the British. One last slide. So I'll make it to an end. I'm being cynical about it. We don't know what's going to happen. It's truly remarkable. If you're worried about immigration, people move around. It's what they do. It's really, really good news if they come to you. Even if you happen to have grown up in a town where almost all your friends had to leave because of the immigrants and there's nobody there who grew up and you do lectures to people and nobody comes from the town, even though you grew up in the town, immigrants are still not a problem. You know, if anybody had a reason to hate immigrants, I have a reason to kind of worry about what happened to my hometown of this. But I don't. I like immigrants. We could sort out Oxford so that people can actually stay here. That's a separate message. And last image of that. This occurred within a few days of that election. And the story of this and the way it was interpreted was all about that election and the changing times. If it had occurred two or three years earlier, and we did get fires two or three years earlier in blocks, it would have been another fire. But it's because times are changing that it's interpreted differently. Everything is moving around. You're about to find out how competent your political leaders are um, and what effect it has on you and your future. I told you about my granddad, he was up in Mansfield Road in the 19, late 1930s. When he went to a lecture like this, I think it was 1937, he was told that a war was coming. But we'll tell you boys, but don't tell the people out in the town, town that a war is coming. And then when in his early 20s he went to fight that war, he met a load of people who were not like Oxford undergraduates, a bit more mixed, and they came back in 1945 and 46, determined that they were never going to believe in the ability and the credibility of a set of people who not just taken the country to one world war, but taken it to two. That's why everything changed after 1945, because the generation had to live through the mistakes of an old set of people. You're about to live through the mistakes 
of an older set of people. And the really interesting thing is what are you going to do about it afterwards? And that's what I'm looking forward to enjoying in the next few years. Uh, and also, I'm optimistic because we're very, very good at queuing. So if you're panicking about March the 29th, uh, yeah. just think people will be able to queue and some of us if we really work it out some of us could do with getting a little thinner along with Hungary we are the fattest nation in Europe uh, if we sort the queues out so people with the wider waistline well, lines are at the back of the queue yeah, we might even get a bit fitter as well uh, thank you very much sorry for going over thank you.